Hello, Mr. Dakar. Thank you very much for accepting this invitation for an interview. On behalf of the Warwick Economic Summit, I'd like to thank you warmly. During this uh, summit, we'll have a few e economists of the development that are going to talk about their views on development and conflicts. So could you please tell us what is your role as the International Red Cross Committee and what are your biggest challenges for the next year? I'm leading an organization which is called the International Committee of the Red Cross and really our focus since now 151 year is really on war and extreme conditions. So I think we are present in 84 countries and, and maybe what is the most striking when you look at our own perspective is most of the crises are protracted. They go on. We are in Afghanistan since mm -hmm. most than 35 years, Sudan 30 years, South Sudan 40 years, Israel, Palestine more than 40 years. Uh, even Syria and Iraq are crises uh, that are going on. And I think maybe this is the biggest challenge for the people we try to protect and assist, is they are confronted with a multiple issues. Mm -hmm. You know, when we think about humanitarian, you know, we think, oh, maybe there's a crisis, you know, mm -hmm. an emergency, let's bring help, mm -hmm. and that's over. Mm -hmm. I mean, when do you think emergencies start in Syria? When does it finish in Palestine? Mm -hmm. When does it start in Yemen? You know, mm -hmm. It's a very complex environment. And I think what is maybe the biggest challenge for me and my own organization, but also I think for humanitarian, is to be able to provide a very relevant response. When you're really trying to understand what are the needs of the people. Not that you develop that here from Geneva or from London or from Warwick mm -hmm. University, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but really cl in close proximity to people. And that's maybe the second challenge is access to people. Okay. A lot of humanitarian right now are, in fact, accessing people through partner, mm -hmm. not themselves directly. Okay. And I think we as humanitarian, we have to be in close proximity with people, including in difficult places. So not only in Damascus, Syria, but also in Aleppo. Not only in Kabul, but in Erat. And this is what makes a hell of a difference when you're very close to people. So that's my two mm -hmm. challenges. Relevant, but also being able to be in close proximity with people. Okay, thank you very much. How is uh, new technology and social media going to help you to access new people in a different manner in conflict areas? I think what, what is amazing is, is how much new technology has changed already the behavior and the relationship we do have with people. I think the, the new things for us is mobile phone. I mean, there is mobile phone everywhere. You know, the, the remotest place in Somalia or in Afghanistan today, people have mobile phone. Mm -hmm. And maybe just to give you a few examples, one thing is it has changed totally the way you engage with armed group, right? Mm -hmm. In Somalia, one of the most, I would say, tough and, and important group is Al-Shabaab. Al-Shabaab, they engage and communicate only by Twitter, since now only at least four years. Yes. So they engage mm -hmm. you by Twitter. So if you do not have Twitter yourself, you're out of the game. It's mm -hmm. interesting. Al Shabab in Somalia, if yeah. you want to start to engage, even yes. you know, like that sitting together, you first have to understand how Twitter works. Okay. If you look at people also, interesting in Afghanistan or in Somalia, I see more and more that the people we try to help communities, you know, they are looking at what we provide, but they're comparing. Mm -hmm. I recently a team went to Somalia two days after. Uh, the tsunami, uh, or let's say Haiyan in Philippines. It was Somalia, different typhoon, very difficult. We arrived there, very complicated for us to cross Somalia. We're there, we're helping people. People, when they receive us, they look and say, you are late. Late? Yeah, mm -hmm. You are late. You are late. <laughs> Why? They look at their phone and say, you know, interesting. We watched, we checked. And in Philippines, it took you 24 hours to respond. In Somalia, four days. So Where were you? They're aware of uh, yes, the Yes, they're aware. I mean, it's interesting because even in the most remote area, even mm -hmm. the most difficult area, people have opinion, people compare, check, uh, and that's maybe something we need to grab. So the new technology are changing also the way people are related to, to us, to armed group, to government, but also, interestingly, also to the diaspora. Mm -hmm. I see also a lot of change. Uh, in Syria, for example, the diaspora is absolutely fantastic, play a critical role. So for us, it's really being able to understand that the people that you're related with, and we still like to be well, we'll offline, you know, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. like we are, human mm -hmm. to human, but I think these people that you talk to are also uh, with you, with their own communities. They connect, they compare, and it's changed their own experience about what you can provide. It's really interesting, thank you. So you were talking about the diaspora. 
and uh, we're hosting Sir Paul Collier, who is going to talk about uh, the issues of immigration. And so one of his statements is that the diasporas, they cause Im immigration to accelerate. So I was wondering what is this, ex what does this acceleration of emigration mean for the conflict countries? How will they be able to recon reconstruct themselves once the conflict ends, if all their elite population has uh, emigrated? It, it's a major issue, and, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm very happy that you have uh, Sir Collier with you because I think well, he's one of the rare men I think who really think immigration differently, and I think mm -hmm. we need that uh, mm -hmm. deeply. Our own experience, if I look at ICSC, our own perspective, and it's only one perspective, what we see is wherever, especially in conflict area, uh, what is the key indicators for people which would make them leave or possibly come back mm -hmm. are two issues. One, security. We always forget sometimes how much security is important. You will never ever come back to a country if you do not have a minimum of security. So if law and order, if your clan, law and order could be by government, but couldn't you see by your clan, but if there is not a minimum of security, you will be very careful to come back, right? Yes. And be economic. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a minimum of job opportunities, possibility for you to find you know, a minimum of earning for your family, I mean, no way to come back. And I think you can do all the plan, all the development strategy, if you don't grasp it, that makes it very difficult. Mm -hmm. And what I found right now a little bit uh, problematic is that both migration, but also security issues and economic issues can hardly be dealt through only the prism of a country. Mm -hmm. Oh, very difficult. Yes. I mean, you can be in Switzerland, or you can be in Europe, in UK, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you can do all the plan you want, all the contingent plan. At the end of the day, you still have to grasp what are the critical questions when it comes to migration and mm -hmm. economy, and you have to sit with other countries. And that's what worries me right now, not only in Africa or in Europe, is there is very little convergence at the international level to deal with global issues. Being conflict, it could be economy, it could be mm -hmm. also migration, and that's what I found so difficult. So yes, I think we will have to look at strategic uh, vision when it comes to uh, migration. We will, in the ideal, like I think Sir Collier is saying, having also a, a, a real realistic approach when mm -hmm. it comes to migration, including talking about contingents, numbers, thinking strategically, but you cannot do that only through prism of a country. Okay. And that's what the problem is right now. Thank you very much for this interview. I wish you all the best. and. Uh a good year for your organization in this agitated 2015. Thank you very much and I hope Thank you all much. the best for your, for your conference yes. uh, and I hope to be with you, I don't know, when will it be in 2016? Yeah, in 2016, <laughs> hopefully. No, I wish you all really a big success. Thank you very much.